Easter and Good Friday go together. <clears throat> Friday, we celebrated the Lord's Supper following uh, Christ's death, focusing on that. And today, we come back. We're drawn to the same table, but this time because of his resurrection life. Uh, guiding us to the sacrament today will be the next passage in our study of the resurrection. And that's in 1 Corinthians 15. We'll start today in verse 35. <clears throat> But someone may ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body as he is determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. All flesh is not the same. Men have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, fish another. There are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, the splendor of the earthly body is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the star is another. And star differs from star in splendor. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual didn't come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual the first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the man from heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. What will the resurrection be like? What kind of body are we going to have? Like so much that is in the epistles, Paul actually is answering actual questions that came to him. The Corinthian church had many questions. This is one of them. And uh, I, I think, you know, if we're going to be raised from the dead and, and we aren't going to die again, then certainly our bodies must become different somehow. How? And my guess is that they were motivated by the very same curiosity most of us have. We've had many of these kind of conversations. Uh, Jesus seemed to appear in locked rooms. He seemed to disappear from sight. Are we going to beam up and beam out? What's going to happen there? At his ascension, he went up into the sky. Are we going to fly? And the uh, question I hear a lot, uh, what, what happens to marriage? And all that goes with it. Well, Paul says some very, you know, very beautiful things here, but he really doesn't answer any of those questions, does he? What he says, in essence, is that bodies are designed to suit each thing's purpose. Animals, birds, fish, all have different bodies suited to their purpose. The sun, the moon, the stars have bodies in terms of a physical makeup suited to their purpose. Our current bodies are built for a world of sin that is temporary. Our bodies, therefore, are perishable. We live amidst dishonor and weakness. Living in a new world without sin will call for different bodies, ones that are imperishable, glorious, and powerful. And whether that means we're going to beam up or fly or be married or whatever, I'm not sure. I don't think Paul knew either. Paul thought about the nature of the resurrection differently. And by the time we approach this table in a few minutes, I hope that we will too. Paul thought about the resurrection in a way that's bracketed by the beginning and the end of this section, these two verses, with a lot of stuff about purpose in between. He begins, what you sow doesn't come to life unless it dies. And then he ended up saying, just as we've borne the likeness of the earthly man, that is Adam, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven, Jesus. Resurrection is all about life that rises out of death. And in particular, those who are resurrected to glory will be like Jesus and not like Adam. What does this tell us about the purpose of resurrection? 
When the original Adam was given life, he was called to become a life giver, a life guarder, a life lover, because he was called to care for all the living things on the planet. The first thing God did had him name everything, had him get to know intimately every creature, because he was supposed to take care of them and the planet with it. And to be entrusted was so much, Adam was going to have to engage his own will in this. To rule in God's image, he had to care about this place. He had to want the sort of life that would care about all life. In other words, he had to pass a test. God set it up this way. He designated two trees. And Adam had to choose. One tree represented life, all life. And choosing it was a choice to guard and cherish every living thing. And the other, the other represented a focus or an exaltation on self, a choice to decide what is right and wrong for me, which inevitably ends up using all the earth and all the creatures simply for our own benefit. Choice shouldn't have been too difficult. Mankind was not to be just another creature. Mankind was going to be given the authority to care for, to husband a planet and all of its creatures. Is God going to entrust this world to be ruled by those who would just use everything else to care about themselves? No. He would first verify that we would use our lives to care for everything else. So God set up this simple test with Adam. Then God created Eve. And Adam was given the particular responsibility to husband one other creature, one other person, and the lives of all the children that they would have together. Now Adam chose not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil at first, and perhaps uh, he thought that he'd passed the test already. But as we know, the serpent, uh, Satan, tempted Eve to eat of the wrong tree. That was sin. When Adam ate also with her, that was sin, and so somebody was going to die. God confronted the couple. What was Adam going to do? See, Adam didn't seem to realize it. But what he was about to choose to do was the last part of his test. People often ask, uh, didn't God see Satan's temptation coming? Of course he saw it coming. God knows Satan better than Satan knows Satan. Eve's temptation by the devil was not the test. Adam was the one being tested. What Adam did when Eve faced judgment, the judgment of God, when she faced death, that was what God wanted to see. That was his final test. How did Adam respond? Yes, he ate from the wrong tree too. That was sin enough. But this was his most disappointing choice. It's her fault. Her fault. That sealed Eve's fate. She was done. Her judgment, certain. And because Adam chose hoping to let her die instead of him because he chose to love himself. He failed to become the man that God meant him to be. And so he left the garden. They both left the garden to die. Adam left the garden incomplete, not fully cooked, not yet what God had in mind for beings in his image to rule this magnificent place. What should Adam have done. Adam was responsible for Eve, her husband. When Eve sinned and faced death, what should Adam have done? What was God waiting to see him do? Lord, I take responsibility for what she did. I was responsible to see that we both chose the tree of life, to embrace all of life, not just care about ourselves. I'm sorry. She sinned. I sinned. I want to live with you. 
but it means more to me that she live than I live alone. Please, please do not take the life of my bride. Take mine instead. Please use my life to give her life. And if he had done that, the Lord would have honored his request. He would have exacted the penalty of death that was earned by Eve by take, and that he shared in by taking Adam's life. But what that would have meant is that even though Adam had shared in the fruit, in the end, he would have chosen the right tree. And that would have been a day when glory came upon this planet, for God surely would have raised him back to life. Very proud of his son. He would have chosen to use his life, to love all life, and thus passing the test. Humanity could be trusted to bring God's image to rule in this place, and the human race would be off and running. But Adam failed. And death might have swallowed humanity whole at that point. The human race might have died before it ever was fully delivered, but the Lord was not at a loss. Before they left the garden to labor and to die in this not fully cooked place, God promised another Adam. Somebody who saw life not simply in terms of what he could get out of it, what he could get out of the world, but in terms of what he could give to it. You see, for Paul, Christ's resurrection was not just an afterthought. It was what God's creation has been waiting for so long. Someone to husband it. The second Adam gave his life for his bride. And of course God the Father resurrected Jesus. He humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place. Resurrection to life eternal was God's response to the first man to love all life more than just his own life. This is how Jesus understood resurrection. He said, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates, who will give away his life in this world, will keep it for eternal life. This is how Paul understood resurrection. What you sow doesn't come to life until it dies. This is the key to understanding resurrection to glory. Everyone's going to be resurrected in some way. But many will be resurrected to dishonor. They will live forever as they are now. When push comes to shove, committed to self, that state of being called hell, Jesus couldn't understand why anyone would want to live that way. Eternal selfishness is eternal torment, a darkness that never ends. You want to picture hell more realistically. I mean, there are images for it that, that don't even go together. They're just images. There's outer darkness and there's fire. But imagine, imagine this world with all of God's common grace that inhibits our sin removed. Every person completely and eternally in love with themselves. Resurrection to glory is the completion of humanity for everyone who wants to be complete. That's how Paul understood resurrection. He said, I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. Becoming, you see, first like him in his death and then somehow to obtain to the resurrection of the dead. Here Paul talks about death in terms of suffering. Not because pain or deprivation means anything in itself. It doesn't. But because giving our lives so more life can grow makes us the kind of people God wants to entrust his kingdom to. Forever. Doesn't that make sense? Now for those of you who were here on Good Friday, let me put it this way. Jesus saw his bride in line for crucifixion, a record of her sins in her hand, just as Eve had half-eaten fruit. Adam 
let God take his bride. Jesus came forward and said, take me instead. Her life, our life, more important to him than preserving his own. I have no words to describe how proud God the Father was when Jesus was crucified. In his humanity, Jesus gave his life away, not just to do the right thing, but out of pure, unadulterated love. Jesus chose the right tree. He was hung on it. But it was the tree of life. Of course God raised him from the dead. No doubt resurrection will mean many wonderful things of a physical nature, a material nature. Maybe we will all beam up and beam around. That'd be great. And we know the Bible says that sickness and pain and death will be gone forever. We know that every tear will be dried. Safe, surely renewed feet will run and renewed hands will build and renewed voices will sing new songs. We'll see those who've gone before not as the seeds that we once knew but in full flower. <laughs> But you know what? I am intrigued most with the one feature of Jesus' resurrected body that he called attention to. The scars. The old wounds. Healed, but having left scars. It was by his scars that his disciples could see that it was really him. The scars testified to his love. He loved all life, not just his own. One way or another, I believe that all of the redeemed will carry scars into eternity. Not bleeding wounds still festering, not markers of pain that defeated us, but simple reminders of some kind, the testimony of lives given away. Adam should have had scars. To Eve and all of their children, they would have been the most beautiful thing about him causing love to well up every time they saw him. The scars are the most beautiful thing about Jesus. And I rather think that all who attain his resurrection will bring with them something, something that reminds uh, of uh, sacrifice in one form or another. Because just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. And that, Paul says, is how the dead will be raised. We come now to the Lord's table. If you're new to SBEP, just follow the others down the center of the aisle, singing with all the joy in your heart. Coming down singing is how we affirm that we are on this journey together. If you can't stand comfortably that, uh, that long, just uh, ask a neighbor to go to the back. We have an elder back there who will serve. Take the, some bread and a cup as you come up, and then you can either just take them straight back to your seat and then partake anytime you want while we're singing, or you can, you can use the whole front. The whole front is open when we have the Lord's Supper. You can stand up here and take, and take the elements. You can kneel on the, on the st steps. You can come up here if you want to be closer to this facsimile of the cross. That's fine. Feel free to do any of that. This sacrament is open to anyone who has confessed Christ in a Christian church and has been baptized. But today, I want to encourage you to ask one simple question before you come. Do I want the kind of life that Christ offers? Some think that Jesus offers forgiveness of self-centered sin so that we can all be, go on forever being self-centered. Well, that's not, that's not what he came for. Jesus offers to share his risen, his eternal, his wonderful life with anybody who wants to die with him. Meaning anyone who really wants to give themselves away. Not just a little bit, but completely. Be buried like a seed in order to multiply a hundredfold. Jesus is looking for people who don't think that that sounds like a bad thing. To those attracted to Jesus, it actually sounds pretty good. They know that they can't manifest such love on their own, but they look at him and they think, well, he can help me do anything. 
Now, see, if you aren't sure that that's what you want, I just say, you know, stay seated, enjoy the music, and think about it. The resurrection body of God's people will be fantastic. No sickness, no tears. I'm hoping to fly myself. But resurrection is God's response to people who give their lives away who are determined to love all life more than they just love their own. For them, for them, the Lord has an eternal kingdom he wants them to care for. Now every week, when we have, I always give an assignment. Or I always say your mission, if you choose to accept it, is something. And today, it's pretty obvious, this Easter week, your assignment would be start giving your life away. It's not a challenge. It's an invitation. It's an invitation to choose the right tree. It's an invitation to bear the likeness of the man from heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your word says that uh, Satan still oppresses us our whole lives with the fear of death, fear of losing what we have, fear of losing ourselves. But your son delivers us from that fear. We believe there is nothing we could possibly give that you wouldn't multiply a hundredfold so that we too end up being blessed more than we ever dreamed. And we know that because after Jesus gave everything, you resurrected him to glory and gave him the name above every other. So here we come again to his table, this time not just appreciating his death, but with the holy aspiration of sharing in it. So that when the time is right, we will also share in the magnificent, eternal resurrection of Jesus Christ. I receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that our Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body. It's broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink this, all of you, in remembrance of me, because we're told as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim our Lord's death until the risen Lord comes again. So once again, in his name, I welcome you to his table.